For those of you joining us, um, most of you already know that our topic for today, uh, we do these Monday uh, marketing masterminds every Monday at 11 a.m. Eastern, and our topic for today is reverse mortgages. It's a logical follow-up to last week, which was how we approach identifying potentially downsizing or right-sizing baby boomers and empty nesters. And one way to provide the most help and the greatest level of service for those folks is uh, you know, being aware of financial instruments like reverse mortgages and how you can uh, or they can utilize those um, in whatever scenario. Uh, and so Jordan, who is my mortgage partner, was uh, uh, gracious enough to get us some special guests here from Mutual of Omaha, who um, one of their specialties is reverse mortgages. So I think they've got some uh, some information and uh, details that they're going to uh, walk us through. And then we'll just kind of open it up for Q&A as far as uh, we can talk about the uh, the nuts and bolts, but also the marketing and, and how to actually use the nuts and bolts or the information to get more clients, because ultimately that's, uh, I'm sure, what we all want, right, is is a, a greater pool of potential clients for us to to help and and serve in some way. Uh, Misty, can you hear us? Yes, I'm here. Oh, awesome. <laughs> yes. And I think I enabled for you to share the screen. I think yes, uh, Jordan had mentioned that you maybe had some slides that were going to help with the presentation. Yes, and I am unsure why my video is not working, but I'm going to put this back on stop video so you at least can see a picture. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me here. Um, I'm Misty Likas. I'm the wholesale trainer at Mutual of Omaha, and um, I'm just going to hit the basics of reverse mortgage and how this could um, you know, help you expand your pipeline. I think there's an untapped market right now for um, realtors and um, Heckam for Purchases, which I'll discuss, and with reverse mortgages. Um, we do have lots of material for you. So um, the information I'm discussing today, I can send that material to you. It's a lot of um, misunderstanding that I have found when teaching the Heckam for Purchase or the Let's get my screen up here or reverse mortgage. So one thing I do want to mention real quick is when we say Heckam for purchase and reverse mortgage, we usually use those two terms interchangeably. Specifically, a Heckam for purchase is one that is um, designed for and by um, HUD, right? So that's what we specialize in. And Heckam for purchase is where you use a reverse mortgage to purchase a new primary residence. So this could be very um, important to your clientele. We have seniors now who are looking to downsize. Some are even looking to upsize or to upgrade. And this is how this product can help them obtain that house that's going to be best for them in you know their golden years. Um, this doesn't necessarily mean that they have to move closer to family, right? In my slides, you'll see where that is one of the reasons that we see Heckam's wanting the Heckam for purchase. They want to move closer to family. But if they want to move down south, they could sell their home and purchase a new beach cottage or a new condo you know, in Florida get that beach cottage they've always wanted. So it really provides a lot of flexibility for your customer, for the borrower. So a Heckam for Purchase, it allows the borrower to take out a reverse mortgage in order to buy a new principal residence. And when I say new, that just means a different principal residence. It could be a newly built home or it could be one that's already established. It does require a down payment. Now, your regular HECM, your regular quote reverse mortgage, does not require down payment. When we have your traditional or quote regular reverse mortgage, what happens is the individual has to be 62 or older, along with some other qualifications. But 62 or older, let's say they have their mortgage paid down or quite a bit is paid down, we're going to take a portion of their equity. And that portion can be turned into cash. 
the remaining quote part, portion of the loan, that's your reverse mortgage. They're not going to have to make a monthly payment. That's one of the primary um, features of the reverse mortgage is eliminating the monthly mortgage payment. How is this possible? First of all, you have to understand that the reverse mortgage was created, geared, and set up specifically for seniors and for them to age in place. It was created for them. It's not a joke. It's not a hoax. It's not um, you know, too good to be true. This is what it is. So the reverse mortgage, they don't have to make a monthly payment. It gets paid when one, the loan gets paid back when one of several maturity events occurs. And that's if the borrower leaves the home, let's say they want to sell the home, right? Of course, the loan's going to be called due. Um, if they reside outside the home for more than 12 consecutive months, if they don't pay their taxes and insurance, because when you take out a HECM, for, a HECM or a reverse mortgage, you're going to have to use, or the borrower will have to use a portion of the proceeds they're going to get to pay off any remaining mortgage they have. Therefore, that means they still own title. It's their title. They have to pay the taxes and insurance. They have to continue to pay those year after year. If they fail to do that, then the loan would be called due. If they reside outside the home um, for more than 12 consecutive months. So if they do go to Florida and they stay down there for a year and a half, that will call the loan due and payable. So there are specifics around the, um, the, the events that will call the loan due and payable, but it's not anything that is ostentatious or that is not um conducive to even what we see now with our forward mortgages. Now with the HECM for purchase, it's slightly different. With your regular HECM, they use the equity in their home, right? They already have that equity built up. So the bank, the lender essentially gives them a portion of that money. But with a HECM for purchase, they're selling their current home and they're going to purchase a new primary residence. Well, that new primary residence does not have any equity built in it, right? Because it's new. They haven't made any payments on it. In order to have quote equity built in that new principal residence, they have to bring a down payment. So the HECM for purchase does require the borrower to bring a down payment because they have not built up any equity in that new principal residence. The same features are going to apply with your HECM for purchase as with your traditional HECM. And by that, I mean no monthly payment. So now your borrower has sold their home. They, yes, they do have to use a portion of that proceeds as a down payment for a new principal residence. But when that times are okay, eight times out of 10, they have money left over. And I'll show you an example. So they use proceeds, put the down payment on the new home. Now the reverse mortgage is going to cover the remaining portion or the remaining balance of the new home price. So their down payment combined with a reverse mortgage should make up the home, the new home price or the new home's purchase price. And the borrower is not going to have to make those monthly payments. The um, payments are deferred until one of five maturity events occur. And as I stated, they should have some money left over because if they have a lot of equity built up in their current home, they won't have to use all of those funds for the down payment. So money used for down payment has to be cash. It could be from the sale of their current home. If they're short the down payment amount that they need, then they'll have to go and obtain additional funds, meaning cash from a 401k or a savings account, or if family members want to gift them money. It has to be cash though. They can't borrow money for a down payment. So before I move on, any questions here? Anyone um, curious? Anything that I can clear up before? And I do see we have a couple of questions. Uh, how do you do determine the down payment? 
Great question. I'm going to do that in the next slide. Perfect. Anyone else? I was told at one point, and this might be misinformation, but I'd like to clear it up, that sure. um, <clears throat> there's a period of time for a reverse mortgage. And if the person that took out the reverse mortgage had a longer lifespan, they could be uh, asked to leave their home once they outlived what uh, the, that term that was in place at the beginning. No. Okay. No. That is, there are only... I'm going to pause this for one second so I can get to that screen and I won't make you all nauseous going through the screens. Hang on one second. The great thing about the Heckam for Purchase is it is or the Heckam, the reverse mortgage, whether it's the Heckam for Purchase or whether it is resume shared, your quote regular. These are the maturity events right here. These are the only thing, only things that are going to cause the loan to be due and payable. The great thing about, well, we'll get to that in a second. Okay, so the first thing is conveys title. And not always does this indicate that it is, um, it is a trigger for them to pay the mortgage back. We see this sometimes in trust, but we don't always see conveyance of title. If they sell the home, as I mentioned, yes, that is going to cause the loan to become due and payable, as would if they were selling the home with any other type of mortgage. Reside outside the home for more than 12 consecutive months. They can take their snowbird um, trip for three or four months, but anything outside of a year, that's when the loan would be called due. How does HUD know this? The servicer is going to send out a certificate of occupancy to the borrower every year on the date, on the closing date. The borrower fills it out, signs it, and sends it back to the servicer. That's really the only way that HUD knows. The borrower has to send that back within 30 days. If the servicer does not receive it, they can start the foreclosure proceedings. The other is if they fail to meet the future property charges and obligations. So they don't pay their taxes, um, the insurance. Also, if the home becomes in a state of disrepair, because this is a, um, a HUD loan, the home is the only recourse that HUD has. So they can't go after the individual's personal assets, right? It's just the home. So when the individual enters into the reverse mortgage, they are stating, yes, I know I have to keep my house up. And finally, the borrower or eligible non-borrowing spouse dies. You have Bob and Teresa. Bob is the borrower. Teresa is the eligible non-borrowing spouse because she is not yet 62. She lives in the home with Bob. She's married to Bob. Bob passes first. Now, Teresa can stay in the home. She still has to pay the taxes and insurance. She won't receive any funds from the reverse mortgage because look right here. She is a non-borrowing spouse. She didn't sign the loan paper. She does not get any benefits of that, but they're not going to force her to leave because she is an eligible non-borrowing spouse. When she passes, that's when the heirs have to make a decision. But nowhere on here does it say if the loan... Um, expires or if the loan is outside of what the original um, balance was thought to be, um, does it say that? Because with the principal limit, that's the amount of money that the borrower is going to be given, we do use the um, expected lifespan, right? So there's three factors involved. And when you put that information into the system, it's going to tell you what that principal limit is for that person. And even if the loan balance exceeds the amount of the home or it exceeds the original amount of the loan itself, that is still okay because there's only two ways that you know HUD can get their money back. And that is by someone naming the heirs Sell, selling the home or buying the home themselves. So they're going to get their money either way, right? They're going to get it back either way. And that's why we use expected 
lifespan, right? Expected life rate, because they're going to want to give someone more money who is older, who is say 75, because the chances of them living another 20 years is lower than someone 65. So yes, I'll give you more money because I know I'm going to receive my money back quickly because of your age. A little morbid, but it's business, right? <laughs> Spouses Thank you do not very have much for clearing that up. I had a real sure. negative connotation about reverse mortgages based on some, you know, uh, you know, untrue facts. So I really, really appreciate that. Perfect. Yes, that's what we're here for. Um, and some of the brochures I'm going to send you all today, James might have already sent it to you, but it is literally, it's a one page brochure of the requirements. And the other one's probably about 15 pages. And it just gives you all the information that you need to know for a reverse mortgage. And it's something you can share with your customers as well. So it's great to look over. It's very straightforward. Um, and I appreciate that, that question because that's what we're here for, to clear that up. By doing that, you're just reaching more individuals, right? Your, your, your pipeline is growing. I do see um, spouses do not well, have to be... Yep, sorry. Go ahead, Josh. One thing real quick, Misty. So for the additional resources and so forth that uh, that Misty is referencing, if you get back to whoever invited you today, we will compile not only the recording of this, but also any resources referenced so that you can have access to them. So we'll put them all in one place. You all have free access to, to all of that. Um, so I'll, Jordan or I, or both of us will get with uh, James and Misty. We'll get that, we'll get that put together. So just get back to whoever invited you today and um and we'll make sure that you have that um so sorry about that misty and no, that's perfect thanks for the clarification questions. yep yeah absolutely thanks yeah so oh here i am i'm upside down okay well there's me i'm askew <laughs> okay well uh, it's better than nothing never seen that before but that's okay we are going to do this go back to regular okay so excuse me i do have a question well yes. showing up is 804340 my name is jeline lee thank Hi, you jeline. um my question is um if there is a reverse mortgage in place and there is an heir however at this time the um property on the um the the market value is not um there so it will be at this point sold as a short sale is the heir in any way um obligated or liable for anything no and let me let me get to that screen and i do see we have a couple questions yeah. i will get back to those questions perfect this is the quote responsibility of the heirs they have three options they can choose to keep the house. Say it's their their family home. They all live in town. They want to keep it. They're going to pay the loan amount or 95% of the current home value, whichever is less. They can sell the home. They'll have six months to sell the home. They can ask for an extension if they're making a bona fide effort to sell the home. The max extension that they will be given is two 90-day extensions because 12 months after the maturity event, their parents passing, that loan is going to be called due. On the first day after the 12 months, if the loan is not paid in full, then foreclosure proceedings will start. And finally, the heir can heir or heirs can participate in the cash for keys program. And some of you may be familiar with that. This is where the heirs will sign a deed in lieu of foreclosure, and they'll receive a small cash incentive anywhere from like three to five thousand dollars, and then they can just fully walk away from the home. And the deed in lieu of foreclosure, the way that it is written and the way that it was being recorded, it will not negatively affect the heirs' credit because once again, the heirs did not take out this loan. And these are the three options that the heirs have so even if let's say on an odd case because we are dealing with humans and emotions on the odd instance that the parents take out a reverse mortgage they're estranged from their only child they both pass now you know scott's given a call from the servicer saying what would you like to do with this house he doesn't know anything about it 
he can opt to do one of these three things. If he just wants to fully walk away, he absolutely can, but he is never going to be responsible for paying back that loan. Why? If we go back to simplistic, simplistic looking, you know, black and white, he's not on that loan. The only person on the loan is the borrower. So there is no trick. There is no gotcha. He could be out of his childhood home or he could be having to sign a deed in lieu of foreclosure. But again, you know, we're talking about something that wasn't his to begin with. That was the borrower's quote property. Now, the great thing about if they sell the home on the flip side of what you were saying, let's say that the loan is now $367,000, but you know, Scott decides to sell the home and he sells the home for even, you know, $500,000. The lender is only interested in receiving the three hundred sixty-seven thousand. The remaining funds go to that heir, go to Scott, so he can make a profit by selling the home if the home is worth more than the actual loan. Now, if it takes a nosedive and the house becomes, you know, derelict and they don't keep the house up, and you know they go to sell the house and it is just not something that's going to bring in a lot of um, money or the market really goes down, um, continues to decrease, then it could be a wash or, you know, a loss for the heirs. However, as you all know, I mean, property is the number one asset that anyone could put their money into. Okay, so... Thank you. Thank you for clarifying that the heir um, is not liable. Um, no. So they're not liable with regards to HUD, but will are they liable on any um, tax? Um, no. Ta okay. No. So there could because, be no tax repercussions either. No, because the uh, whether they walk away from it or whether they decide to keep the home, if they decide to keep the home, they're just buying home outright for 95% current home value or the loan amount, whichever, see, whichever is less. So if the home, you know, the, um, you know, grew in equity. So let's say the home is now, you know, $500,000, that loan is 400,000. They just have to pay the $400,000 and they can take out a loan themselves. They don't have to bring cash. They could do the other. So it really is in, in all of this that I'm telling you today is going to be told to the borrower at their counseling session with that HUD approved counselor. So the borrower is going to know all of this information as well. There's not going to be any surprises at all for them. They can ask as many questions and everything that I'm explaining to you today is going to be explained to the borrower so they know exactly what happens after they pass and what their children have um, or what their options would be. Okay, so in this sense, the borrow has passed. The questions are at this point from the, are from the heir. And I do see what you're saying that the, um, the heir uh, is now um, responsible for 95% of the current value of the home. Um, however, I will say this, the, the appraised value of the home is um, $10,000 less than what is currently owed. Okay. So, yeah, so there is no equity. Okay. Mm -hmm. If hey they guys, want to keep the interrupt? house. Guys, can I interrupt for a second? This is uh, James Raymond. I'm the account executive. I'm just going to say hello to everybody. because I know we've been going for a while. I'm just going to throw out when I do a little something different with some of my guys, I just throw this out there. Let's just say the home is worth a half a million dollars and the client owes $200,000. Well, obviously the heirs and the family are going to want to keep the home. So they're going to sell the home and, and, and take the, and, and they're going to sell the home and take the, uh, the equity, or they might just keep the home and pay it off. Let's just say the home is worth 500,000. I mean, worth 400,000 and they owe $500,000. The client, the heirs get to buy it 
for 95% of the current value of 400,000 or $385,000. It's, it's that simple. So it's their way of keeping the family home as Misty said. So at 385, uh, at 385,000, they're buying 95% of its then current value. The MIP and the, uh, the, the initial mortgage insurance premium and the premium and the annual mortgage insurance premium cover that loss so the heirs can keep the home. Does that make sense? Well, thank you. If you were, that was directed towards me. The problem is the heir recently purchased a home within the last 12 months. The heir is not able to purchase that home but to get another mortgage at that point, at this point. So um, you if just I said could. they purchased the home but couldn't purchase the home. You're saying they inherited the home. If they inherited the home and they weren't able to get another mortgage, they would have to walk away from the transaction. So if I can, what I'd like to do is we'd be happy to explore this specific scenario more. Yeah. I want to I want to sort of I can go over with her back later. to uh, what Misty's sharing and the questions that are more general um, in nature, but not not to deflect that we can certainly do a deep, but I think it's probably best done outside of this so we can get into the nitty gritty and get you a, a, a more yeah, individual yeah. individual scenarios loan officers and their real jokes could give me a hollow and i'll go over that yes perfect. absolutely perfect thank, thank you, you thank so you much. Josh. thank you yes you bet you bet so just going back to some of those general questions um how do you determine the monthly income they get that is a good question that's determined by um how much money that they are going to receive from the reverse mortgage. And that is based on the expected rate, their age and the value of the home. So let's say they have, they're receiving $300,000 for the reverse mortgage. Um, there is specific scenarios that you can put in the system, the LOS, and you can plug in if they are asking for $1,200 a month, you can put in $1,200 a month and see how many years that their funds will give them $1,200 a month. So you really need to look in the system, um, but that's how it's determined. You basically take the amount that they're going to receive and then you can play around with certain situations. So sometimes, it's going to be less than what they want because they don't have a lot of equity in their home. Are these standard HECM principles? Or are these companies? These are standard HECM, Jay. These are standard HECM principles. Are heirs responsible for the balance of the loan amount? Okay, we talked about that. Can a borrower purchase a reverse mortgage if age is over 62 but currently renting without the status of being a homeowner? Uh, Pia says yes, but yeah, I was like, I don't know, because you have to be a homeowner, right? You're using the equity in your home. If you're renting, you don't have equity in that rental property. So you don't have a property to bring to the reverse mortgage. Right. Now, if you have a complex, a, du a duplex or a complex, so I own um, this duplex here. I live in A, I rent out B that's different. You can certainly use your condo complex A as the reverse mortgage and then put down that B is your rental income. Um, and that's, we see that too. You can do that as well. Another great question, Misty, this was from, from earlier. Can a buyer or borrower have another mortgage besides a reverse mortgage? Yes. Um, it, it, the example I just gave, uh, you have the reverse mortgage, but let's say you, you have a rental property, right? And that's through, um, you know, ABC Bank. And we can't use that rental property as your primary residence because it's not. It's your rental property. We can only use your primary residence. So, yes, you can. Um, we will use the primary residence and what equity is built in that primary residence. And if there's, let's say, you know, $20,000 left on that mortgage, that will be paid off with the funds given to you at the time of closing. So that comes out of the funds that the borrower is given for the reverse mortgage. Uh, question, spouses do not have to be 62 years of age or older, question mark. Correct. So 
the borrower, the borrower has to be 62. If you are under 62, you cannot be a borrower. So uh, Bob and Teresa, if we have Bob and Teresa, Bob, and I'm just using this general, Bob and Teresa, Bob is uh, 65, Teresa is 60. We have to know if Bob's married and we have to have her information, you know, date of birth, things of that nature, right? If they're married at the time of the application and living in the same principal residence that's going to be used for the reverse mortgage, she will be considered an eligible non-borrowing spouse. We have to determine she's a non-borrowing spouse, but then if she's an eligible non-borrowing spouse, meaning she lives in that home with Bob, then if Bob passes, she's not going to be forced to leave the home. That's why we have to determine who the spouse is and if the spouse is living in the home with the borrower at the same time um, that they place the application. I know you're probably thinking, well, of course they do, but I have a friend or our friends, Mark and Sandy, they've been together. They've been married 11 years now. They have separate homes. It's probably why they've been married 11 years now. They have separate homes. So um, separate primary residences. So it does happen. And we also um, acknowledge same sex couples, you know, depending on what the law states um, as a as marriage in the state that you're in. So no, the spouses do not have to be 62 years of age. I will tell you this though, let's say Bob and Teresa get the mortgage. Let's fast forward seven years. Teresa wants to be on the reverse mortgage as a borrower because if Bob passes away before she does, yes, she can stay in the home, but she won't receive any monthly payments that they set up, right? So they can refinance to put Teresa on the mortgage, on the reverse mortgage. So they're just refinancing, going through the whole motions again, but now we're going to put her on as um, a borrower. If they divorce, Bob is still the borrower. Five years later, he gets married. Now he's with Sally. Sally is just an individual person. She will not have any um, benefits to the reverse mortgage because she was not married to Bob at the time of application. Again, if he wants to refi, put her on, that's different. But kind of think of it as like as a, a Christmas ornament. Whatever happens at the time of the application, whatever goes on, you put it in that ornament and it stays there. That's it. Anything that has to be changed, you got to break the ornament and change it again and change the inside of it. How did my, um, how the standard HECM principles are come with? Got our ears responsible for the balance. Okay, got that. Can the borrower purchase a reverse mortgage of 62 We currently burn the pay. Um, heirs should also consider attorney's fees and probate estate. They can decide to sell. Sure. Yeah, exactly. All that. Um, uh, if they divorce, four, does the co-borrower have to sell or move? Um, James, if they, yeah, so I was if they just popping in. So that depends yeah, upon divorce. the that depends upon the property divorce decree and the property settlement agreement. If, yeah. If the, if the divorce, say if the if one person wants the marital home, there's usually a buyout involved. Uh, and if there's enough equity in the transaction to make it happen, then that, that it goes that way. Uh, you can also, there is, when you're doing a refinance of a reverse mortgage, there are certain rules that have to, there's a certain borrower benefits test. However, in the cases of divorce or adding a spouse, you know, a new spouse, uh, those rules are not, uh, those, those litmus tests are not in play. So uh, can you refinance out of a HECM? So the answer is, Depends upon the scenario and if there's enough equity in the transaction. But can you yeah. I want to read the whole question, James, for everybody, because some some people can't see the chat. Can you refinance out of a HECM if they if the need is not there anymore, as if they took a HECM to help finance long term care and the spouse passes, let's say? Yes. Perfect. Perfect. Just for full full context of what the uh, the question was. Um, other questions, comments, et cetera, for James or Misty, and you don't have to use the chat. If you want to open your line, you can certainly do that. And I want to mention again, for those of you, if you arrived late or just missed this, there will be additional resources, um, flyer, pamphlet, uh, this, this slideshow, et cetera. We're going to put that all together 
into our, our Monday ma uh, Marketing Mastermind members area, which is free to anyone. Just get back to whoever invited you, and then you can go back and review those uh, those items and and have the, that literature and that collateral um, as you have conversations uh, with folks who this might be a good fit for. Uh, Sandy, I think, had her hand up. Go ahead. Yeah, if you if your parents pass and they have the the heckum, and there is um, there's not any equity left, are the heirs responsible for that? And you may have. I'm sorry if you've already covered this, but I'm just no, trying to they, no, they are not. We did cover it. Yeah, so you'll be able to watch that in the recording. They are not responsible for anything. You can just walk away from the transaction. Thank you. You're welcome. Hillary, if Bob and Therese, I'm not sure who Bob and Therese are, but they're fictional characters in this scenario, weren't married, but have been living together for the last 20 years, does she have the same rights when Bob passes? No, no. unless she was part no. of the transaction at the time of the closing. She wasn't in the Christmas ornament. I don't know why I, I just, I don't know, around Christmas time, I, I just was, it just popped in my head and it's like, whatever is, whatever happens at the time of transaction, it kind of freezes in time, right? It's like, that is what, those are the people that are in this reverse mortgage who are, you know, identified in the reverse mortgage. So no, the money you take out at the time of the loan, is there a tax liability on that? No, tax, nope. No, so there's the money not. you take out at the time of the loan, is there a tax liability for that? And the answer is no. Great question, Roger. That's a good question. So briefly, I, I think the, the, the value of this and having this knowledge is so that you can have an educated conversation when you're talking with clients. Are you the preeminent expert? No, but you want to be able to have an educated conversation and then know where to turn to have a more uh, detailed or, or expert level uh, um, involvement on a specific scenario. And so, as I mentioned, we're gonna put all of this uh, materials together for everyone. Um, and it may be just, you know, for your business and, and the type of clientele, just having that general information is, is where you want to stop. But you may be someone who this is an audience that you really want to proactively help and serve in your market. And so, you know, things that you would maybe consider would be, uh, does it make sense to me for me to do a, an in-person or virtual workshop, right? Um, a, a, free, a free workshop of some kind. And again, you could do it virtual on Zoom like this, or you could do it in person. Um, it may be that uh, you use the, um, you could even turn the, uh, the pamphlet or the report um, that you'll get access to. You could, you could use that as a lead magnet um, and offer that information in exchange for, for uh, contact information, right? So, you know, uh, submit your information here for this free pamphlet uh, with all of the ins and outs of reverse mortgages, right? Um, so, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm not suggesting that that's, something everyone should do, right? But everyone should have some basic level knowledge of this so that you can have an educated decision when it comes up, right? Because okay. it may be something that you're not necessarily interested in, but you've got clients and they've got parents and they come to you and say, hey, you know, I, my parents are in this situation. What options do they have, right? And so you want to be the person that at least can... Um, provide some basic level of information and then connect them with an expert or experts that can have that more detailed uh, conversation with. And so if that's something you want more help with or uh, more details about, et cetera, again, get back to whoever invited you here today. We can make those connections. We can help with those marketing concepts uh, as well. Um, and, and uh, you know, how to build those frameworks out. So um, James and uh, Misty, Thanks so much um, for your time and your expertise and uh, and for taking us through this. Uh, we do have a couple of uh, questions that now, uh, two more questions that came up. Um, this is a scenario. Two sisters are beneficiaries of their father's trust. The father's pass, the father passes. 
Can the one sister buy out the other sister if she has very little income? Mm, Potential, the, the, the simple answer to that yeah. is potentially we would need a greater depth of knowledge and to, to run that scenario. It's a very simple mathematical formula to qualify for a reverse mortgage, but this is that sounds like more of a scenario question. We wouldn't be able to cover that in the depth necessary to answer it. It all depends upon the client's age. It all depends upon the income. It all depends upon you know, the taxes, the insurance, their monthly debt load. So the answer is potentially, but unless see, unless we see hard numbers, we wouldn't have that answer. Somebody also asked out earlier before that, uh, Josh, Roger Hinkle, the money you take out at the time of the loan, is it is there a tax liability for that? The answer is no. Right. Uh, there is no tax liability on borrowed funds. Yep. Um, no rehab property. I, I'm assuming the scenario is, can you can they use a HECM for purchase and purchase a property that needs no. rehab? No. There Fair are Easy. real cool. Where'd it go? Yes. There is no bed and breakfast. Let's see. There are no, here are your ineligible properties. Perfect. That's self, that's super helpful. So I have an anti-money laundering background. So my mind always goes to the dark side and hey, what, you know, what are these people trying to do? You know, so that was my first thought was when I first learned about, you know, reverse mortgages, it was well, what's stopping anyone from buying a B&B, &B, right? And you're double dipping. And that's exactly what you're doing. You're double dipping. So let me get this heckin' for purchase. You, I don't have to make payments on this. Actually, I can get payments monthly and I can run this B&B, &B, but that is not allowed. Um, and, and like you were saying, Josh, I love it. You don't have to be an expert on it. The information that I'm going to send to um, Josh, you it, it's going to answer most of your questions. If anyone needs additional information or wants, you know, individual training, you can reach out to James, and then we he'll reach out to me, and then we can set something up for you. But if anyone's asking you, well, it's too good to be true, how is that possible? The best answer, the most clear answer, the straightforward answer, and the true answer is this program was created for seniors so it all of your standard um thought process regarding a forward mortgage doesn't necessarily apply because the program knows that the people that it's geared for are not working 40 50 60 hours a week they're they're in their retirement years it's to help them in situations where they need cash or maybe they want to establish a line of credit and they just they just don't want their monthly payment anymore for whatever reason. So um, any prepayment, no, no prepayment penalties are required length of repayment. No, that's the great thing. If you want to pay, make a payment, absolutely, you can make a payment. But if you start making payments and then decide, I don't want to do this, it did not, that's perfectly fine. You can make one, you could never make any, but there will not be a prepayment um, penalty at all. Yeah. And then yes, Debbie, you can buy a multi-unit one to four, but you have to reside in one of the units, right? Well, that would be multi-unit two to four, obviously. Um, but you have to reside. Has in, to be your primary. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Primary, right. Not just, it has to be primary residence. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So- uh, Really ahead, quickly, sorry. Josh. So do I understand what you just explained that you can purchase a one to four on a Two reverse mortgage? I mean, obviously one use, would just be, yeah. As long as you're in one of them. Okay. As long as one of the units is your primary is residence. your primary residence. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. All right. So I'm going to well, take care of some housekeeping us. items to wrap up. Uh, I'm sorry, was somebody else? Oh, that, no, that was just me, Josh. I was okay. just thanking you all for having us. Yes. Yes. So uh, thanks again, Misty and James. Some housekeeping items to wrap up. Once again, get back to whoever invited you for the additional resources. We'll get the recording in here, et cetera. Not only that, but you can review all of our past Monday Marketing Mastermind sessions, replays, resources, et cetera. That's number one. Number two, for those of you interested, at 1 Eastern, which is now uh, just over an hour away, at 1 Eastern at the same link, growwithjosh.com forward slash huddle. We're going to be talking about um, business funding um, and what opportunities and options there are for that. Uh, it'll be a general overview and, and sort of an ask us anything type of uh, presentation that was originally scheduled for Friday last week. I had to reschedule because 
because I have too many kids uh, is just the reality. Um, uh, so that's that's going to be at uh, at one Eastern for those of you that want to join us for that. Uh, number two, every uh, Tuesday morning at 1030 a.m. Eastern is Texting Tuesdays. And uh, so I will be live uh, for Texting Tuesday tomorrow morning at 1030 a.m. Eastern. Those are live streamed to my Facebook uh, group, as well as YouTube channel and even on my LinkedIn you can check those out. If you don't have the link or know how to attend, just get back to whoever invited you. Uh, we have our big group coaching at 1230 Eastern tomorrow. Um, and then we are back for our uh, regularly scheduled huddles on Wednesday and Thursday at 11 a.m. Eastern. Uh, those are open to guests. So if you would like to join us for one of those, um, just uh, you know, get back to where I've invited you and you can certainly join us as a guest. Um, and, um, I think that's it. I think, uh, we've, uh, sufficiently, uh, yes, th there will be recording posted and et, so, et cetera. Um, so once again, just get back to whoever invited you, you will get access to the recording and the additional resources, uh, mentioned. Thanks again, James and Misty. Uh, thank you so much for taking some time here on a Monday morning. Thanks everybody for the great questions and, uh, interactions, et cetera. James, it looks like you've got something for us. Yes, go ahead. Remember, for any Nexa employees that need me, I have a daily spot in the yellow support platform if anybody needs to come visit me. I've been there since day one. Appreciate that. And if you're not sure, uh, get get back with uh, whoever invited you. They will connect you with the appropriate Nexa uh, uh, MLO who can get us connected with James. So great stuff. Thanks again. Let's make it a great week. And for my uh, folks in my organization, you better bring some wins for Wednesday. Bring back some wins for Wednesday. Take care and uh, talk soon. Bye, everybody.